Well, we have a very special guest this morning. This lady served as our representative from the 3rd Congressional District here in Tennessee for 20 years. And I, I can't remember anybody in my lifetime that served that amount of time in Congress. And I'm talking about Congresswoman Marilyn Lloyd. Marilyn, it's good to see you this morning. look real good. It is good to see you. I'm so happy to be here and visit with you. I really look forward to this. And we, we had a lot of good times. Oh, I was. Being on your show on Sunday morning. I was talking to your friend Mike King yesterday, and uh, I said, Mike, you worked for Congresswoman Lloyd as her press secretary. What do you remember about her most? He says, she loved to work. Said she, she never did anything that she asked us, or she always did what she asked the staff to do. If if the staff, you know, had to be there twelve hours, you were there thirteen hours. Sure. And, and Mike says, I remember works. that she was a she was a workhorse for the, the people the, of this we district. We didn't we didn't keep hours. And you you did that practically every day of the week because you'd come home and you were making speeches and going to meetings and so it's, on. It is a seven day a week job, and of course. Uh, the, the trips home on every weekend were, were pretty hard. It would be hard for me to do that now. I think I served in the best of times, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my committee work and work that I could do here, and, and also the work that I was able to do for Oak Ridge in that area in, in the field of energy. So they were good times. We did good things, and now I'm happy to be home. You're not staying home now, though, because you're very active on the Airport Authority Board, I believe. Oh, on the Airport Authority. Uh, with, I've been active with Room in the Inn Lung Association. This year I will be uh, chairman of the Race for the Cure. I'm looking forward to that. I'll see you a lot this year because mm-hmm. we certainly want to uh, really push to have the biggest Race for the Cure that we've ever had. I will be working with the Lung Association for this Women of Distinction. I've got I've got a new goal with this, Earl. I want to branch out and make this a larger event for the community. You know, we have a lot of activities in town to honor the men, mm-hmm. the distinguished men. But this is the only thing that we do in the community that on- seeks out and honors the women that have sacrificed and worked hard for our community to make this a big event to, to recognize the women that need to be recognized. And I will be working on that to make that a big event next year as well. So I've got a lot of things I'm, I'm interested in, and life is good. Bring us up to date on our airport. I know we've had a lot of challenges over the last 15 years. Uh, the loss of Delta was was a big blow to this community. Oh, Where do we was, stand? It was a terrible uh, loss to all of us. That was the year that I went on the airport authority. As the member of Congress, I knew how important that our airport was to our economic development. So I asked for the assignment, and this has been my sixth year on the airport authority it's it's been very frustrating at times but we have worked and want to do even more to try to bring more air service into Chattanooga is there any prospect at this time of getting a major carrier well to come we had uh, so we had some good prospects but of course not 11 sort of put a damper on that we were working for a service to Fort Worth, to Dallas, and also, of course, we had just gotten one to Pittsburgh, which you've lost now. And we were working on one that we really were very excited about into Baltimore, which would have helped us a great deal. But you must remember that, that we still serve, we have spots to five cities in addition to Atlanta, which is uh, about 55% of the market. Then you have Com Air that goes to Cincinnati. Then we have our flights and Northwest into Memphis. And, of course, we have our U.S. Air Express that goes into Charlotte, as well as our, our service in, into Memphis. So we, we do have a lot of flights that go in and out. We do have competitive fares now. And the main thing is, is to get more people to fly Chattanooga. These flights are still going out about 24 or 25 a day. But they're still going out about 50% capacity. And, you know, there's just so much that we can do as an airport authority, but people have to try to fly and really look at our fares because we do have competitive fares, if, especially if they're bought uh, about 14 days in advance. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the outlook is, is sort of a mixed bag right now. Well, right now that um, we're down about 13 percent but uh nationwide that's a little bit better than the average 
Now, one of the things that we're very excited about is that this initiative that, that we've been working on is a small airport development pilot program grant that we've applied for, the mayor's applied for. We've applied for 315000 and this will be used on marketing purposes. And as you know, the mayor has appointed a special uh, task force that will look at ways to to spend this sort of money as incentives, perhaps to 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 bring more airport air service into California before he went to Congress. And he knows the problems of small cities. And it's real. It is real. There can be delays, uh, and. I must admit, I get as frustrated as the next person. Because you fly a lot. I fly a lot, and and not counting the the flights I've made overseas, I'm over two million miler. And and yes, I go to Atlanta, and I get frustrated at times, as everyone else does. But by and large, you have to look at how far we've come mm-hmm. and what what our goals are and what we're trying to do. Atlanta has been talking, and I think it's still in the talking stage, but maybe locating an airport somewhere between Chattanooga and Atlanta, uh, maybe around Calhoun or Adairsville, would this have a negative impact on what we're trying to do here? I think that needs to be looked at very carefully. I don't think I could have all the answers to for us to discuss this morning. But at the same time, I think we need to concentrate right now on making our airport in Chattanooga, the best airport it can be. But we are dependable on <laughs> we are dependable on, on what goes on in Atlanta. You know, I mean, they say when you die, you go through Atlanta. You know, that's true. And thing, things will never be perfect. Earl. Yeah, yeah. My guest this morning is former third district congresswoman Marilyn Lloyd, and uh, we've been talking about the uh, the airport authority. Uh, you go back and forth to Washington quite a bit. Not now. I'm not going back uh, as much as I did. Uh, when I was working for Lockheed Martin, I mm-hmm. went more frequently than I do now. Are but you still consulting with Lockheed any? No, you know, they lost the Oak Ridge contract mm-hmm. and uh, sort of well put them out of the energy business here. You know, as you know, UT took over that contract mm-hmm. by UT Battelle. But uh, I'm really enjoying not having to make the trip as I used to do. I'm much happier going to Florida in January and February and, and having a few days off. You know, a few things I still want to do while I still have time. Did you know uh, Larry Condit, Representative Larry Condit, any? I work served with in him? the Congress with him. What type of man was he? What we've been hearing on the news reports? Pretty level-headed? I was never a very close friend of him. I would see him uh, on the floor. It was a long time before I realized he was a Democrat. I, oh, really? He said, over oh, near the Republicans. And I thought the guy was a Republican for a long time, and I would see him to speak to him, but I was never a personal friend of, of Gary Condit. Yeah. Have we blown this issue out of proportion, you think? I think he brought it on himself. If he did, I talked to one of my colleagues, uh, St. Montgomery, about it after, right after it started, and he, he died. He was laughing and said, Larry, Gary kept saying, oh, this is just going to blow over. Well, it didn't blow over. Mm-mm. He didn't handle it right. I don't know whether he's guilty. I don't I mean, I certainly wouldn't judge the man, but I would say I th- he could have been more forthright with the public. In public office, you have to come forward early on and say what's on your mind and not hide and run from the media, don't you? You can't run from the media. You can't run and hide. When you're a public servant, you're accountable to the public. And uh, I'm sorry for the Congress that... Uh, Gary Condit behaved in the manner that he did. And, of course, he was not elected. He lost his primary. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the people had the last word. My friend Marilyn Lloyd, former United States congressman, is in the studio with me this morning. Marilyn, you started out back in high school doing radio, didn't you? Uh, Yes, I enjoyed it. Uh, It was really very exciting. I'd taken public speaking lessons. We used to call them dramatic lessons back in those days. And... um, don't want to date myself, but that's the way it was. And uh, I got a job working temporarily at the radio station. I liked it. And they would give me all the bad slots that nobody wanted that I did a lot of filling in. I enjoyed it very much. We still have some bad slots that nobody <laughs> wants if you want a part-time job. Uh, you and your husband, the late Mort Lloyd, decided to, to buy a radio station in Dalton, I believe. We put WTTI on the air. And... Uh, Actually, he had, he had applied for the license that 
that Luther got the DFFM, uh, and we didn't get it. We were very disappointed. We oh, were, really? We had applied for that frequency. Sunny ni- and WDFFM 92.3. We had applied for that. And Luther I got never it. knew Luther that. Luther got it, and we didn't. And so we still wanted a radio station. We heard about a man that had, that had applied for a, a frequency in uh, Dalton, 1530, and so we went to visit the person. We were able to go in business with the person, get mm-hmm. the license. We put the station on the air. Were the frustrations of a new station, mm-hmm. and of course, it didn't make as much money as we thought it would. That we wanted to make, that we anticipated, and instead of doing the bookkeeping on weekends, I ended up doing a, m- a morning radio talk show. I sold advertising and recorded in the afternoon. So I had a very busy life with the radio station, but we did uh, sell it for a profit, so it worked out well. What was the name of your morning radio show? Morning with uh, Morton Marilyn. A cute title. It was, uh, we had some household hints. Uh, Mort would read his poetry that he liked to do. It was a good program. We played easy listening music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How did you meet Mort? I met Mort through some mutual friends, and uh, he was a very distinguished, very caring person. Cared a lot about this community. And as you know, he was one of, of the original, really, not the original pilots, uh, but he really worked hard with Harry Porter to promote aviation in Chattanooga. Right, right. How did he get interested in TV? Well, that was before my time. He came to Chattanooga to do radio with WDEF, Uh and he did the very first television broadcast in Chattanooga, and he maintained the number one rating for his entire life. Nobody could touch him. That's true. That's true. I, I remember. I remember you sit there and you, he didn't read the news to you. He told you the news. And uh, I think one of the really the great traits that made him a good announcer is he talked slowly and he would look at you. And he was easy to understand. Mm-hmm. And he had no big ego. He was just there to, to be your newsman. And the community liked him. They did. and But it was... When you look at what a newsman did at that time, Earl, that that certainly uh, uh, doesn't take place now. Mort would go out with Tom Eason, and they would gather the news. They would come back, and they would develop the news film. Then they would put the news together and report it. Mm -hmm. And you look now at the vast news teams that we have. It's certainly uh, a different picture. It's an entirely different field. I guess in the wintertime, he never saw daylight, did he, at home? <laughs> Not really, no, no. He, uh, Leave he, early he in the morning and uh, he, get home he, late uh, at night? He didn't see the house in, in the daylight in the winter. We worked hard. How did he get interested in politics? Mort Lloyd was very dissatisfied with politics as as he saw it. And I think he saw it pretty well close up. He uh, worked hard, I know, for Ralph Kelly's. He wanted to see him be mayor, but he was very dissatisfied with the representation in Washington. And he just said one day, I'm going to do something about it. We had been um, flooded out. We had our home in Brainerd, and we were staying at a, at a motel because the house was underwater, and we had the radio on, and, and the, the present congressman said, Oh, this is a beautiful day here in Washington, Luther. You should be here to see the cherry blossoms. And certainly we weren't seeing any cherry blossoms. And we sort of felt that representative should have been at home looking after the people. So he decided that he would try to make a difference. That's right. And he won the Democratic primary. He, he won He won the, the nomination, yes, right. of the Democrats. Okay. Where were you when you learned that his plane had gone down? I was in the campaign office by myself. Really? And I was his as much involved in the campaign as Mort was. We we were work we worked very hard together. We worked very hard at the radio station, we worked very hard together in the campaign and we were a good team. And someone called and said, uh, I just heard that Mort Lloyd's plane went down not knowing that he was talking to me or that I was there by myself. And of course after that people did come in and But you were the you were the one to take the initial call at the campaign headquarters. That's right. It was Tom Hogue called me. Yeah. You remember Tom Hogue? Oh, yeah. Tom was a reporter at Channel 12. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
after his death, you decided that you would hit the campaign trail. I was pushed into it pretty quick, but looking back, it was a decision that had to be made quick. It, that couldn't be made at a later time. That you had to go or go. And there were several of the Democrats, that, well, really the, the very liberal Democrats who were very angry with me because they felt like it was a chance to win the election. And some of them is, went as far as to go to Washington and talk to my good friend, Congresswoman Lindy Boggs, and said, don't you think you should talk her out of running? Because we're going to lose this election for the Democrats. And she said, no, indeed, I won't talk that lady out of running. It really made the Washington seem pretty unhappy. Carl Albert sent me money. Uh, Lindy Boggs helped me. And after the election, Carl Albert called me, the, the present speaker, and he said, I told him that little lady was going to win that election. So I did get good support out of Washington and my friends here. And certainly then all the, the Democrats did rally. You told me, though, that when you had to make that decision, you told me years ago that you were scared. That uh, you, said, you said, I was scared, yeah, but I, I caught scared. on fast. I believe those were your words. I, I, I was scared, but I felt that that this is something that that God had in his plan for me to do. Mm-hmm. And you stayed in contact with the people for the entire time that you were there. I know you would call me quite a bit. Uh, a lot of people say, I got a call from Marilyn Lloyd today, just, you know, asking what was going on back in the district. Uh, you must have had a little book with telephone numbers in it, and uh, you frequently check with some of your friends. I did. I, uh, especially on tough votes, I always called home. There's sometimes I voted with my party, sometimes I didn't vote with my party. But I tried my very best. Of course, I was never perfect, and I never will be perfect. But I did try my very best to represent the will of the people of this district as I saw it. You worked with five presidents, President Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. Um, Don't tell me to rate them. <laughs> well, let's start with President Carter. Good man, good moral man, but... He had his problems with Congress, didn't he? Jim Carter, I think, is seeing his best days right now. He's doing good work. He's a true man of God, and I'm very grateful for him. My problem with Jimmy Carter was he clinched a Clinch River Breeder Reactor, which is my big project in Oak Ridge, and think where we might be today with our energy shortage and dependence on foreign oil if we'd been able to continue with the Breeder Reactor. Mm-hmm. And... Certainly, um, I think we'd, we would have a different ener energy situation than we do right now. So you fought the White House on the Clinch River project. All the way. And one time I got him to go t to take Air Force One down to Oak Ridge, and I rode down with him. He said, and Marilyn, I want to tell you one thing right now. You know that my mind is made up on Clinch River, and don't think that this trip is going to change my mind. He was very specific about it, and he didn't. But he listened. He 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 uh he was determined that uh, that that he well I think he sort of saw nuclear power as sort of an evil empire. He uh, he certainly was not the friend of nuclear or power. Uh, I didn't know Gerald Ford too well. I had defeated one of his uh, colleagues, mm -hmm. and he didn't think I was all that great. But uh, but he was polite. He invited me to a rose garden party at one time, but. I think that, and of course, I'm I'm so sorry that uh, that the Clinton administration had all the problems that it did. If if it wasn't for President Clinton's rendezvous with Monica Lewinsky, he would go down in history as probably better than average president, wouldn't he? Because he passed a lot of legislation that a Republican Congress sent him. Is that true? Well, if you look at the condition we were in, the, was, the economy was in the best condition it's ever been in the history of the country. Look where the stock market was. The unemployment rate has gone to zero. Our country was in the best shape it has ever been in, to my knowledge. And it certainly did a lot of good things. And I'm hoping that history that will record him as for all the good things he did and not look at the... the the terrible tragedy of the Monica Lewinsky episode. Ronald Reagan 
and Marilyn Lloyd were on the opposite side of the fence some, but they also were on the same side of the fence. And I believe that you went to the White House several times while oh, President we Reagan went. was... He was a, he was still a Teflon president, Earl. He, he got by with a lot, but he had a wonderful personality. And he... I think he, he did a lot of good things. I think I really believe that he was having more problems with his memory than uh, most we people knew. realized before really? he left. I know one time I was at the White House and I was sitting at the, the summer c- party for Congress and I happened to be sitting at the same table. And I noticed some of the notes that they gave him when when he got up to speak. It made me think that he was having some problems at that time. But he served his country well. He used to call you on some of those key votes, too, didn't he? Oh, they all did that, that's for sure. I I guess I I think that um, although we were on opposite sides politically, I have a great deal of respect and admiration for George Bush Sr. And he, uh, he worked very hard to be a good president. And what I really feel that, uh, he did not get credit for that I would like to see more politicians get credit for as he made his big statement read my lips no more taxes and yet when the time came that he realized that there had to be a change in tax policy he did it knowing full well he was going to lose the presidency but he put what he thought was in the best interest of this country ahead of politics And I would like to see more politicians do that. They tell us that a lot of the money is going for experimentation. Uh, You have firsthand knowledge about pharmaceuticals. I mean, it it does really cost a lot of money to, to, to go to the laboratory and to try to develop a new drug, let's say, for cancer. I mean, we, we all know that, that we've got to have new drugs for cancer because that's one of our uh, greatest health threats today. The drugs in the pipeline uh, are, are immense, but it takes so much money to develop these drugs. But the, there are three different stages that you have to bring them through before they're ready for the clinical trials even. Then you have to go to all the expense of the clinical trials. So, yes, drugs are very expensive. And I think that um, it's safe to say that we are developing the drugs that are sold out of our country, but we are that are paying the price for the development of the majority of the good drugs. And we do not want to get so far out that we discourage or make it prohibitive to develop the new drugs. So there, I think that we've got to be a have balancing to, act. Then. I think we're going to have to balance the seesaw. That's going to be hard, isn't it? It's going to be very hard, and I don't have a magic wand to come up with with a good answer. I think that is going to be the hard one, of the hardest policy decisions that that this Congress will have to make, but they're going to have to do it. What about this Congress? Are they they doing their job, uh, or do you follow it? I don't follow it as closely as I used to. I really thought that when I I got out of the Congress that I would watch C-SPAN, but I have other things on my agenda, and I'm I'm busy every day, and I I really don't... uh, keep up with this as I guess I should I think that uh, this will be a very political year of course when uh, it looks as if the uh, Democrats may take control back of of the House of Representatives they're going to work very hard to do so and there's going to be a lot of money spent in this election but this is a political year and that's why I really believe they will do something about prescription drugs What about President Bush's W's job performance. You talked about all of the other presidents. What about our current president? Uh, you like his performance so far? I think he's done the best he can with the foreign situation. As you know, I didn't vote for him. I voted for Al Gore. But I think that he's certainly he's doing everything he's, that he can possibly do at this present time. He's got a... And I support him in his initiatives. He's got a potentially hot potato over there with Pakistan and India right now. Oh, a very volatile situation. I hope that we're all praying. I would like to see us to do more praying for our leaders at this time. That they will have the knowledge and have God's blessings and 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 their leadership. What about the Middle East? Jimmy Carter tried, got a pack. 
Uh, President Reagan tried, President Bush tried, President Clinton tried now, President Bush is trying, but they still fight. Uh, you have any, well, any hope for any type of agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians? I don't see it on the horizon. I don't see it on the radar screen. But, as you know, this has been going on for many generations. Yeah. But somehow I hope they can reach some peaceable agreement to stop the unnecessary bloodshed of the young people. That it is, It's really beyond comprehension what we're, we're hearing on the news today. After you... After you stepped down after 20 years in Congress, did you have any desire maybe to run for another political office, maybe like senator? Not for a minute. Not for a minute. I'm, I'm enjoying being home and doing a lot of things that I've never had time to do before. This will make, this coming month will make 12 years that uh, I've been a breast cancer survivor, as you know. And I was given, because it was, I was completely shocked and taken by surprise when I found out I had cancer and I had a phase two breast cancer and I was given a 50% chance of survival so God's been very good to me and I want to give back a lot that's been given to me I, I, I work on I'll be working on the race for the cure I work for room in the end I, I, I try to give a lot back because a lot's been given to me there's still a lot of things I want to do when you learn that you might not lick that breast cancer. What went through your mind? You just do a lot of praying and turn it over to God. Soul searching, huh? You have to do a lot of praying. And I still do. This is something I pray about every day. You never stop praying for it. Even though after 12 years, you uh, feel that the chances are pretty slim that, that you would have recurrence. You still pray for it every day, and you also say, Dear God, thank you that I'm alive, and show me where I can help someone today. Yeah. So there's a lot of things I want to do besides travel to Washington. But you still you still read the papers and follow a little bit about oh, what's going sure. on. Oh, to I'm involved in other campaigns. I'm going to meet Bob Clement in the morning for breakfast. I'm going to miss a luncheon. Senator Clinton's having, but and I'm going to meet with Senator, with um, uh, I guess he is Senator Lincoln Davis, who's running for Congress, and uh, I uh, will be helping Phil Bredesen. So I've got a full plate. You're going to work for the the Democrat ticket this yes, I will work this, this yes, summer and fall. Ticket. Yeah, but I think uh, it's going to be a very hot political year this year. Bob Clement, Lamar Alexander, and Ed Bryant all have good names. They all have good names. Why are you supporting Bob Clement over the other two? Well, he's a Democrat, and he's my colleague, and I believe he's the best choice. You think he's got the credentials for the job? I do. And I think you'll make I think you'll make a good senator. Are you weighing in on this income tax question that is being debated over Nashville right now? I just wish that uh, we could put... Uh, the good of the state above politics. I'd like to see a few representatives say, you know, I know this is going to cost me my election, but I think it's right, and I'm going to do it anyway. Are you convinced the state is really in financial trouble? Sure, we know we need the, the money out. I don't really understand where some of our uh, candidates are coming from because we know that we have a problem, and... Um, as Phil Bredesen said, that he wants to get in there and, and see where he can make some changes. And then if we have to find additional sources of income, that we can do that. But the present time, we've got a problem and we need to fix it. And perhaps a, one of the gubernatorial candidates have better ideas, but they're, they're not elected yet. We've got to solve the problems right now. Would you say that this legislature might be taking a wimpish approach and not really stepping up to the plate and uh, and, and trying to hit the ball and uh, uh, score a home run for Tennessee? I think that's been said many times. Let's go back to your years in Congress. What uh, what do you consider the high point of your 20 years? I wanted to ask you that. Uh, I know you're proud of many accomplishments, but is there one particular accomplishment that you're proudest of while you're in Congress? Well, 
first of all, the first thing we did was get, you know, we only had two lanes of a bridge across the Tennessee River. We got the money first year for the bridge. And I had a fundraiser in, in 1975, and Tip O'Neill came down to do my fundraiser, and we took him across the bridge, showed him what I, I really needed, our predicament. And he went back to Washington and told the Public Works Committee, he said, give that little lady down there that bridge she needs. And he did. A lot of people didn't, like Tip O'Neill, didn't realize that he was the reason that we got the, the bridge across the river. So that was he a, wasn't your favorite person at times during legislative sessions, he's though, was me, he? But looking back on it, and I, I have both of his books, uh, he is my favorite person. Really? He did. He did a lot of good things. And then he, uh, he was, he was, he was good to me. He, he was very angry with me at times because I didn't vote with him very much, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you still got the money for the bridge, huh? But yes, I still got the money for my bridge. And then we were able to get the the money. Senator Sasser and Jim Jimmy Carter and I got the the money for the the UDAG development where we have the the, the uh, TVA complex and mm -hmm. our hotel and, and the trade center. That was a big deal. And then I guess the funniest one was the city wanted some sort of transit system to go from the choo-choo to, to the aquarium downtown. And uh, the only thing I could find was something for an electric vehicle. Nobody wanted an electric vehicle. Nobody thought about an electric vehicle, but that's all I could find. And look what electric vehicles have done for us now. Oh, we have them run every 10 or 15 minutes that's true. downtown. And it's a wonderful industry here now. And that's that's one of your projects that you're and, proud of. And, but I, I said, look, only thing I can get for you is money for electric vehicles. I can't get any rail money for mm -hmm. you or any of the other things that they wanted. So I said, okay, we'll take electric. And look what a wonderful in industry we have here now. The 80s were a difficult time, especially those early years, because I remember you went back to Washington. President Reagan had been elected. And one of the first chores was was to try to whittle money out of the budget. And it really had an impact on municipalities. I remember walking into City Hall one day, and Pat Rose was sitting there at his desk. And he was really wondering, where are we going to come up with the money to fund some of these projects? Because uh, the Reagan administration and Congress were looking, I'm talking about, you know, a lot of money that you were having to cut. Would you say that those early 80s were really the most challenging times of your 20 oh, they years? Were, they were tough years. They were tough years. Uh, because when the, with the Reagan administration, a lot of our, our funding did go down. And you had to get your very special earmark grants for it. But having said that, I can honestly say, and I'm asked this a lot of time, what my greatest accomplishment was. And my greatest accomplishment is when I walk down the street and someone will stop me and say, you didn't know this, but you helped my... One a lady last week said, had tears in her eyes said, you helped my husband get his disability when we thought that we were at the end of the row. And my husband is graduating getting his doctor's degree this year. And we thank you. Other people say, you know, you got my husband in the veterans hospital. And the things that we're accomplished that help people on an individual basis are the really the, the greatest accomplishments that warm my heart the most. It's not the buildings, it's the people. So the legislation was important, but the benefits for your constituents stand out and, and really shine. Gave me the greatest joy, okay. greatest personal satisfaction. I know you've got some personal commitments, and I'm going to let you go, but I wanted to ask you, have you been to New York City yet, to Ground Zero? I haven't been to Ground Zero. I would like to go. Have you been? No, no. I've Like you and everybody else, I've seen the pictures. Where were you on September the 11th when you learned about this tragedy? I was at home, and I'd been doing my morning exercise, and bam, it I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. During the 20 years that you were in Congress, were they talking about the possibility of a terrorist attack that early? Of course, that was 20 years ago, rather right. vaguely. You know. So this is something. This is something that surfaced maybe in the mid 90s. Then after you had left office, uh, it was not a, a predominant uh, theme. But I must say that we spent an awful lot of money 
an FBI, a Secret Service. And I think the American people want to know what, why. Why we didn't know it. I think that uh, this Congress has responsibility to the American people to come up with some better answers. The FBI is not in the best respected position among people right now. I mean, they've made. Uh, there's supposed to be a lot of changes that have been announced. Uh, uh, the FBI wasn't this way when you were in Washington, was it? No, I, I don't remember anything of, of this magnitude. How did we get in this shape? I, I, uh, I mean, that's the question as a as a taxpayer, Marilyn, that I ask is how did how did our FBI and our CIA get to this this position where that that we we don't have the intelligence that we ought to have. But whether it falls on, on the Clinton administration or the Bush administration, I'm not trying to finger point. I just say the American people have a right to know our tax dollars at work should have given us better protection. This is my feeling Yeah. on September the 11th. And the greatest tragedy in the history of our country has happened and I think the American people want some answers. I want to thank you for coming down and uh, sharing uh, in an hour sort of uh, a little This Is Your Life. Uh, I've had a great time with you. I didn't know. I didn't know. There's one thing you said this morning. I didn't know that WDEF beat out Morton Marilyn Lloyd for the license for that FM station. Now, that's something that I will remember the rest of my life. I didn't know that. Best wishes to I've you. I've had a good time with you. Godspeed. And uh, you. And you're doing a great job. I love your music. I love your station. I love the way you do your commercials. You do, you like that, huh? One of these days we're going to have to go to the Riverside Catfish House. We'll do that. All and right. i got to go see what Earl Merodin's got on the show. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you, Marilyn Lloyd, ladies and gentlemen.